for um, really those who could be the most forgotten in our community. Uh, there are babies that are stillborn at home, and often they are abandoned in dumpsters. They are left off at fire stations or in front of ER buildings uh, or doors, the emergency department. And those babies often uh, are then cremated by the coroner and put in a box and left on a shelf. Until this organization called the Garden of Innocence started down in San Diego and eventually found its way up to Fresno. And now there's a group of men and women with great compassion. Uh, they've worked out an arrangement with the coroner's office that when they have uh, these babies, that they turn them over to the Garden of Innocence. And what happens then is uh, there are folks in the community who volunteer and they make wooden urns. Uh, there are other people who uh, are given a baby. They're told a, a boy or a girl that that baby is now given a name. That name is put on the uh, wooden urn. Uh, a poem is written in tribute to that baby. And then about three to four times a year, a service is held. Mountain View has designated an area of their cemetery just for this purpose. And uh, yesterday we had a service and we buried 11 babies, uh, six boys and five girls. Uh, and I have to say yesterday's was probably a bit more personal than some others because um, the first girl that came by had been given the name Ashley. And so uh, that, that got a little personal. And then uh, a, few, a few babies later was Hope. And so uh, anyway, it was, uh, it, it was a beautiful service yesterday. Thank you for those of you able to come. But it was already getting hot outside yesterday at that service. And then we had a wedding yesterday at 5 o'clock outside in Madeira. When the clouds came over and the humidity escalated, um, when I got home and I took my suit off, I just put it in the dry cleaning bag, but it wasn't dry. It was wet. All right? I, I actually performed a wedding in a wet suit. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I need the drums. Just boom. Uh, but anyway, it's good to be here. Hey, we're going to have a cooling off week this week, so thanks for being here. Uh, welcome. If you are a guest today, you honor us by your presence. There are some communication cards in the pew in front of you. I'd love for you to fill out, put it in the offering bag when it comes by. We promise not to beat on the door, bother you on the phone, or sell your information to Google. But we will send you information in the mail that tells you about our church, our staff, what we believe, and the ministries that are available if you'd like to participate. So we'd love to get that in your hands. You see the picture of what took place last week here. Uh, first off, anybody been to the bathroom? No, I meant to look at them. All right, all right, you got in. What do you think, huh? Woo. All right, look good. Look. Ladies, yours is not quite finished. Uh, yeah, you're right. Well, uh, you do not have the automatic soap dispenser yet. Uh, they only had one in stock, so they sent one, and that got put in the men's, all right, because you need two for the women. So those are arriving Monday or Tuesday, and they will be, well, I meant because you have two sinks. I didn't mean that badly. You all have two sinks. The men only have one sink. Thank you very much. So anyway, uh, you will have automatic soap dispensers, so you don't even have to push the thing and get your hand dirty pushing it down, all right? Uh, so... Uh, Bathrooms are now finished. We're very excited about that. This is what got started, as you see the picture up there. Some of you know, when I first started in ministry, I was in the carpet business for three years. I have never seen an installation like this one. It should have taken a half a day to have taken the pad and the carpet off of the stage. It took four days. Uh, for reasons that no one can know or understand or explain, when the people who did this did it, they took the glue with a trowel and spread it over the floor and put the pad down with that. Usually there's no glue on a pad. If there is, it's just a little S-curve in the middle so it doesn't slide under the carpet. This was troweled over the whole floor. That's a mohair pad, not a rebond pad, really nasty stuff. Then they took the carpet and troweled glue on the back of the carpet and put the glued the carpet to the pad. It took four days for these guys to get all of this off, and you can still see bits of the mohair still on there, and uh, so now they'll have to float this 
uh, with a little thin set before they can put the new floor on, on the stage. That will be after Vacation Bible School next week. But uh, if, if I could have explained what this room looked like late Friday afternoon, you all could not believe it, all right? Uh, number one, VBS, all the props and stuff being done, all those were built and assembled over in the bridge. Uh, lots of hands over there doing that. Mark Addis, number one, in leading the decorations for this. And uh, all that had to, could not be brought in until after they finished in here on Friday night. So that was all done yesterday. Uh, the janitor had already come and gone. And when you walked up to the pews and you did this, dust flew big time, all right? Uh, I still saw just a little on that one, all right? <laughs> I better pick another pew. All right, oh, this one works better. But anyway, I put out a quick call uh, Friday afternoon. We had over a dozen people here yesterday morning with their own vacuums, vacuumed all the pews, dusted everything, uh, even helped finish up the bridge over there. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you who responded. Uh, many hands did make very light work. Uh, folks got here a little before 10, and they were pretty much finished by 1030. So uh, it went really, really well. So thank you for that. We may be sending that call out again before all this is over, all right? right? Uh, but thank you so much. Um, let me highlight a few things and then we'll get engaged. Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow, 9.30 in the morning, 9.30 to noon. If you are a volunteer, you have a volunteers meeting at 12.15 over in the bridge today, all right? So 12.15, you'll get to get your uh, volunteer shirt, you'll get directions about your assignments, all that kind of stuff. So 12.15 if you are a volunteer. If you do not have your kids signed up, it would be wise to get that done today if you can. Otherwise, show up very early tomorrow to get it done so things can start on time, all right? Fireworks will go on sale next Sunday. You've already seen the booth is out there. Uh, we do a fireworks display here because that helps cut the cost of our high school kids going to camp. Uh, it's about 500 bucks for every kid who goes to summer camp. It's very, very expensive. So we do our best to cut those costs by 100 or 200 bucks to each kid. So uh, please, uh, if you're going to be buying fireworks, you can pick those up. Uh, that says on the first, but I was told the second. So anyway, uh, it'll be out there and up and going, all right? Uh, men's breakfast July the 8th special guest speaker can't wait to hear this guy uh, this is a neighbor of Mark's uh, he was really given about 48 hours to live and uh, he's still living and he discovered God's purpose in his life through all of that so can't wait to hear th <coughs> that whole story Several of you have already asked me today, Tim, are there more books that you sold last week for Enemies of the Heart? That's the uh, sermon series that we just completed, and I wanted you to have the book written by Andy Stanley that was kind of the foundation for that message series called Enemies of the Heart. We sold 100 of them last week. We ran out before everybody could get them in the third service. We did order more. They did not show up uh, by yesterday, so they should be here Monday or Tuesday. We will have them available for you to purchase next Sunday. If you're not going to be here, you can go by... Uh, uh, you can go by, uh, I almost said Fresno Bible House, you can go by Majesty Christian Bookstore, and uh, I believe they have some copies in stock as well. Um, all right, Ryan. Uh, Ryan's going to come up. Ryan is the face behind uh, much of the technology that happens around the church, at least the stuff that goes right. Uh, and the stuff that goes wrong, you can blame me for, all right? But the stuff that goes right, uh, Ryan is responsible for. Um, what I wanted Ryan to do, we had in our bulletin for the last month or so, the fact that New Hope Church now has an app for your phone, all right? So if you have a smartphone, just like you have apps for other things on it, you can have a New Hope app. And so Ryan is going to help some of us who, though we have smartphones, what that really means is, is that they are smarter than we are. He's going to help you kind of walk through how you can download that app on your phone and what the benefits of having the app on your phone would be. All right? So, Ryan, we're yours. All right. Thank you very much. I'm on here. Okay, there we go. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, yeah, like you said, we have a New Hope app now available to us. So uh, the cool thing about this app is it keeps you more connected to our church. So um, go to the next slide. The big thing, too, is that it enables us another way to give. 
as well. So you can give on Sunday just like normal during offering. We also have a QR code as well, so you can scan that and you can give. You can also give straight okay. through the app. May I just ask a question real quick? Just to, how many of you know what a QR code is? Raise your hand. Okay, thank you. How many of you have no idea what a QR code is or how to use it? Okay, thank you. Have you all wondered what that QR code on the bulletin was all about? You might just tell them real quick. Yes, a QR code, it's, um, it's a funny little thing. It's kind of like a barcode when you, you know, when you go to the grocery store and they have the lines. This one's just a bunch of dots instead. So we have a QR code, and if you scan that, it'll take you straight to um, the New Hope site where you can give as well. So they can scan that with their, with their smartphone, yes. You have to download a separate app. So that's why I, re I recommend you download the New Hope app because you, you can just skip that step entirely. So this is just, it's just another option for you all if you want to do that. Um, but yes, we have the New Hope app, and as well, you can give on our website. So you can go to the video. So this, I did a quick video just demonstrating how to actually get the app. The fastest way is just open up your phone, go to the web browser, and just go to newhopechurch.net. So nothing out of the ordinary there, just going online. And uh, once you get to our website, which this will pull up in a second here, you're just going to scroll down. It shows you our Sunday service times. But you scroll down, and there's two buttons. It says download in the App Store or download in the Google Play Store. So if you're on an iPhone, you're wanna, you want to go to the App Store. If you're on uh, an Android device, you're going to go to the Google Play Store. And it'll pull up a page just like that. With um, You can see the details and a little picture of what the app looks like. And you can go ahead and download and install that. So this is downloading that. And the time will vary in how long it takes to download, depending if you do it on data or on Wi-Fi at your house. Um, but you can go ahead and do that right now. I, this is the only time you're probably going to hear somebody recommend get out your phones during church right now. So go ahead if you like. You can pull out your phones. And you can go ahead and go on the New Hope website and start downloading the app. And this should be finishing up there. And then once it's done, you can click open. And you'll, you might get a notification on it once this actually goes. It says, would you like to allow push notifications? So the cool thing about that is... At New Hope, when we have events, we can send you know, notifications, reminders, and things like that about events coming on at church. And so we also have um, a couple different options as well. Through the app, you can, like I said, you can give. You can view the calendar of all the different events taking place um, on campus. You can as well watch the past sermons and listen to them on your phone. You can read the Bible. And you can also, um, you know, we have connect cards in the backs of the pews. You can uh, do a digital connect card through the app as well. So if you have prayer requests, or if you'd like to update your information, new email address, phone number, um, I recommend doing it that way. It'll get to us a lot sooner than on just Sunday. So um, that's just a couple of the things the app can do. I totally recommend you go ahead and download that and uh, give me some feedback. Tell me what you like and don't like about it. So thank you very much. It was funny a couple of, we've had the uh, we've had the app in the bulletin all right that you could download this for about a month and it was a couple of weeks ago I was walking down the aisle greeting folks and and there was a, there was a young lady she was downloading the app onto her phone and she said this is so cool I, I got to be honest I didn't think it was all that cool when they told me we had it but I'm glad you think it's really that cool what what is nice and again if you're new here please know we don't talk about giving all that much here. Um, but, but having the resources through online and through the app uh, to where you can give, what makes this great for churches? Uh, in the past, uh, the only way to give was through Sunday mornings. Uh, and in the summer when people are gone and traveling a lot and they're not here, guess what? They usually give. Usually the lowest, summer, the lowest months for church giving is in the summer. And sometimes it's been in the past drastic drops several thousands of dollars. And part of it is when people aren't here, they don't think to give. Uh, the problem with that is uh, the PG&E still goes on, in fact, higher than normal. Uh, the, the trash still wants to be picked up, and uh, I still want to be paid. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so what's been really cool is to see over the last two years as we've added the QR code, as we've added the online giving, and I think this summer we'll see a difference as well, the, the giving stays much more consistent, and, and so that's pretty exciting for us. So anyway, we just want to let you know it's been out for about a month, but we haven't had a Sunday where we had enough time that we could could do that and so we took that time today thank you Ryan very much uh, I hope most of you know this couple that's in the bulletin with their picture Bill and Lindsay Eccles they're not in this serve yay up here Amanda uh, Amanda had them both in high school and now in their college group uh, but Bill and Lindsay are still part of our church family Bill still teaching uh, children's Sunday school third and fourth grade still an elder in the church but 
Uh, after 12 years of service in our high school department, they have stepped away from our high school program. Last year, they added the college group. They took that on as a, as a, as a new ministry here. And uh, it's been going well, anywhere from 15 to 25 college students meet in their house every Thursday evening. And uh, so they were honored and recognized for their 12 years of service uh, last Monday night in the group. And we wanted to let you know, so if you run into Bill and Lindsay, please say thank you, thank you, thank you for their involvement. The kids love Bill and Lindsay, all right? And Bill and Lindsay love most of the kids. Uh, no, they, they've loved them all, all right? They have loved them all. So we just wanted you to be aware of that uh, special commitment that they had made to New Hope Church and how that commitment has changed. Uh, there's an insert in the bulletin. It has the date on it this time. Uh, this Wednesday night, right here in this room, Sherman, not Sherwin, who is the painter, Sherman Williams is going to be speaking. Sherman was the backup running back at the Dallas Cowboys when Emmett Smith was setting all the records, all right? Uh, he was, he's a very, very good athlete. He uh, was an All-American at Alabama, the Crimson Tide, before he got drafted to play for the Cowboys. Uh, then he ran into a little trouble, and he spent 15 years in prison. During that time, much like Chuck Colson, he discovered Jesus Christ, and uh, what a difference in his life. He spent the last 10 years, all right, trying to connect with people of the difference that Christ can make in his life. He's bringing his daughter to Fresno for an on-site uh, visit at Fresno State. His daughter is an athlete. She's here out visiting Fresno State. And so Joe said, hey, why don't you speak at our church? So he's going to be here this Wednesday night. He gets to speak on this stage, all right, uh, on Wednesday evening. So here's how this is going to work. From 6 to 6.45, uh, barbecues, chips, and beverages will be available out here in the pavilion. So you want to come from work and have uh, a quick meal, uh, you're going to be able to do that. And uh, we'll have fans going outside. We will have some rooms open also on the inside for you to enjoy your meal. Then at 6.45, we'll gather over in here, kick things off at 7 o'clock. Uh, it's it's, it's, not a bit, it's going to be Sherman Williams. We're going to introduce him. He's going to speak to us, probably be out of here before 8 o'clock that evening. Uh, if you've got friends who love football but wouldn't come to church for any other reason, it's a great time to bring them. I think you're going to enjoy them. I've, I've uh, had the opportunity to listen to a little bit of him online, and uh, you're going to enjoy Sherman Williams. He's a very good communicator. Uh, Betty Drews, prayer request. Betty Drews continues to improve. She has been visited, I know, by a few folks this week. Steve has seen her. Kathy has seen her. She's doing uh, very, very well, and we're grateful for that. Uh, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, I have a memorial service for Tom Wells. If you would remember his twin sister, uh, Crystal, and his dad, Tom Sr. I know they would appreciate it. Tom been living in Indianapolis for the last six or seven years, and um, um, this is a difficult one. Uh, they believe that he probably took his life. Uh, don't have confirmation for sure of that, but that is the belief. So it's a tough time for their family. Please uh, be remembering to pray for them today. It's good to see Bernice back. Charlene is home. They go back for a visit in Stanford again this coming week. Uh, so we'll be praying for them as they travel. So those are the few of the updates we wanted to bring to your attention. One last announcement that was just handed to me. There are some folks who need a host family for three weeks during the summer. So these are students from France. And they would love to meet you. Uh, they're 17, 16, they're either 17 or 16 years old. Um, there's four students. And so I have the information up here. It'll be sitting on the front pew if you would be interested in having a foreign exchange student in your home for three weeks during the summer. I don't know any more about that than that right now, except I have the information up here for you. All right? You want to know how cute she was? <laughs> Were you asking how cute she was? <laughs> uh, okay, all right. So anyway, the information will be up here. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Then we'll get engaged in our worship. Tim, how's your week been? Been good. All right. So we're going to worship fun good today? We're going to worship good today? We are. All right, what are we singing? We're going to sing God is Able next. We're going to sing uh, I Surrender and You Deserve It. I love it. All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the life you share with us. You never promised us a life without trouble, but you promised us your presence in the trouble, and for that we are very grateful. Thank you that um, you are far more faithful to us than we are to you, and you do not hold our lack of faithfulness against us. Thank you that we can come to you with our needs. There's nothing too small, there is nothing too big, there's nothing too insignificant, but what you 
do not care to hear us share it with you. It's not the fact that you don't already know about those needs, for you do because you are God, but you love to hear your children talk to you, to share with you what's going on in their world and what their responses to these things are. And so, Father, I hope that in the context of this room right now, there are many who are pouring their hearts out to you with the things that are important to them. Father, thank you for your word and its timeliness, no matter the fact that some of these scriptures have been written thousands of years ago, they still have application to our lives today. It's almost as if they were written last week or yesterday. Father, thank you for the presence of your spirit in this room, not only because you come to live within us as Christians, but you say when we gather together, you come to be engaged in the midst of what we're doing. Father, there may be those who've walked in here today uncertain as why they entered the doors of a church today, but something brought them here. And I pray they will not listen for my voice, but I trust they will be listening for your voice as you choose to speak to them where they are. For the privilege of giving and sharing, we say thanks, and may we use it to expand your kingdom work around the world. Lord, we pray for uh, Shelley Actus and uh, and her dad and the situations that are there you know more about them than we do but we trust you with them today uh, father we just simply say thank you for our kids who are going to be on this campus probably 100 to 120 kids monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday uh, part of it is having fun but part of it is also learning about you thank you for the volunteers and their willingness to be here and we pray for stamina uh, both with the kids and with the heat and uh, father may your love shine through them for all of this, we give you thanks and so much more. Amen. Just before I jump into the message, I want to talk about one more thing, because I forgot to do it earlier, but it's important. Um, next Sunday night, we're going to start something that uh, we haven't done in 20-some-odd years around here, uh, probably close to 25 years, and that is we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to do a soft opening of Sunday evening church. Um, and what that means is, is we're going to start, come the fall, the Sunday after Labor Day, there will be a regular Sunday evening service here, all right? Um, we're going to do a soft opening during the summer. It's going to start next Sunday night, and we're going to do it every other week, all right, for, uh, for eight weeks. So we'll be doing four during the summer uh, just to sort of uh, figure out all the things that we need to do so that we do it right when we really kick it off in September. Um, some of you are saying, why are you going back to a Sunday night service? That's the same question I ask uh, as we started talking about it. And, and, and actually, we, we've been talking about it for about two years around here. Um, I think there's some really good reasons for us to, to bring back a Sunday evening service. Please, I want you to know one thing. It's not designed to bring everybody back on Sunday morning on Sunday night. It really isn't, okay? I know that's going to sound weird. I don't want all of you all back on Sunday night, Okay. Uh, I'm not going to show up every Sunday night, okay? Because um, do you understand the problem we would have if all of you showed up on Sunday night? We'd have to have three Sunday night services, all right, to get everybody in. So that's not, that's not the purpose for Sunday night. Uh, there, there are multiple reasons that we are, we are going to bring back a Sunday night service. And, and, and if we get to December and it hadn't worked out like we thought it might, we won't be doing it next year. All right, it's that plain, it's kind of that easy for us to figure out. But here are reasons we think it would be good for us. First of all, we get frequent requests of people saying, you know what, we would love to come check out New Hope, but we work on Sunday mornings. Do you have a Saturday night or Sunday night church? So that's one of the reasons for doing it. Number two is we do have people from our church who have to sometimes rotate Sunday morning, Sunday nights in their work schedule, and they would love to be able to come to a Sunday night service on those occasions when they're working Sunday mornings. Uh, there are some people who say, you know what, particularly during the summer when we go on vacation, we get back Sunday afternoon, we'd come to church on Sunday night if you had a Sunday night service. All those, one, uh, those are some of the reasons why we're doing it. The other is we've discovered uh, we've got more talent in the church than what we're able to use on a Sunday morning. And some people don't want to start experimenting with their talent on Sunday mornings. They would rather have uh, maybe a less frightening experience, all right? And so Sunday night would be less frightening because Sunday night is going to be less formal. And some of you are saying, this is formal? <laughs> but uh, you understand what I, what I, what I mean. Um, I realized that when I, from the time I was 15 till I was about 21 and I was preaching, pastors didn't call and invite me to preach on Sunday morning at their church. They called and invited me to come preach on Sunday night. 
And so I learned to get better by preaching on Sunday nights. We've got some young men that think God is maybe calling them into ministry. Uh, be great opportunities for us to kick them off, all right? Give them opportunities that, that we don't always have. Uh, number two, we've got several guys on staff who can preach and who can preach well. Um, I'm not gone very often. Uh, and so this will also provide more of our staff opportunities to preach on Sunday nights. Not every Sunday night will be preaching services, all right? Uh, there's going to be some variety in that. And so uh, we're, going to be, we're going to be kicking that off next Sunday night. Uh, we're going to start in the bridge, okay? We'll, we'll start, in, if, if it gets bigger than what we can hold in the bridge, we will move back to the big sanctuary. Uh, but, but we're going to start out in the bridge. Uh, we got some college kids, all right, is, uh, that, that would like to be engaged in worship. And so primarily our worship team, not always, but uh, a great deal of time is going to be out of our college department, are going to be leading worship. Uh, some months we'll emphasize some things that will appeal to one's age group. Other months it will appeal to a different age group. Here's what I'm hoping. We see a mingling of the age groups, all right? You don't only come for the ones that appeal to you because I want you to get to know each other better. Sunday nights facilitate fellowship better than Sunday mornings do. Sometimes I'm telling you to hurry up and get out of here on Sunday mornings. It doesn't give you time to visit and engage with other people. And we hope to do things after the Sunday evening service on a semi-frequent basis that will enable engagement in a little bit different way than what we're able to do on Sunday mornings. So, um, uh, Mark... Mark, I saw you in here. All right, stand up, Mark. All right, just so you know, our associate pastor, full time now, and see what an associate pastor does when he's full time. All right, <laughs> he has done a great job. Mark, you're kicking it off next Sunday night, and we know it's a holiday weekend. All right, but we're still doing it. Uh, and your theme is? Okay, so encouragement. So that's going to be the theme for next Sunday night. So you want to be encouraged? Show up next Sunday night. Uh, uh, Chris is doing one, and it's on joy. No, mine's on joy. Mine's on joy. I'm doing one. It's on joy. Uh, mine's on joy and laughter. We're going to, we're, we're going to have fun. We're going to, uh, what time? Um, 6 o'clock. I had to pause and think. Uh, 6 p.m. All right. So, uh, and we'll have this in the program by next week, what the schedule is and what the themes are. But anyway, uh, if you're not doing anything next Sunday night and you want to come hang out, 6 o'clock next Sunday evening. Okay, now let's jump into Word. And so I'm not yelling for you guys to hurry up and get out of here because it's 10.07, all right? And we've got to, here's the deal. We finished a Bible study, I mean, we finished a sermon series last week called Enemies of the Heart. We were in it for about four and a half months. We're going to do about a six to seven week uh, summertime series. And then uh, we'll have one that will kick off in the fall and you'll start hearing about that in a couple of weeks. What we're going to do for the summer is my favorite minor prophet. It is also my wife's favorite minor prophet. She's been asking me for about five years, could you preach Habakkuk again? Some people pronounce it Habakkuk, okay? Personally, I would not want to be called a kook. So I prefer the pronunciation of Habakkuk, all right? You will find Habakkuk tucked away in the back part of the Old Testament between Nahum and Zephaniah, all right? Do you guys know where Nahum and Zephaniah are, all right? But it's towards the back. Um, there are 17 prophetic books in the Old Testament, and they are divided up into two categories. Do you know what those two categories are called? Major prophets and minor prophets. That is correct. Do you know how many major prophets there are? Five. five. Very good. All right. All right. Very good. There are five major prophets. Um, if there are 17 prophet, prophetic books altogether, how many minor prophets are there? Twelve. Twelve. Good. All right. Um, do you know why they're called major prophets and minor prophets? Who said that over here? Yes, that is correct, Judy. It is the length. It's the size of the book. Okay? Um, the minor prophets are very short. The major prophets are very long. All right? And so that's the reason for the difference in them. And uh, we're going to be looking at the minor prophet Habakkuk. Um, Habakkuk contains only three chapters. 
And when you put all three chapters together, there's only 56 verses in the entire book. So here's a request I'm going to make for the next six weeks. I'm going to encourage you to read the book of Habakkuk every week before you come. Just take the time. 56 verses. It can't take you more than about four minutes to read those 56 verses. So just read. Don't try to figure out everything that it means. Just read it and see what God begins to speak into your heart about this. Habakkuk is unlike the other prophetic books in that it records a dialogue between one man and God. Whereas Isaiah contains a message from God, Habakkuk records a conversation with God. This is a two-way conversation taking place. God rarely explains himself in the Bible. He's God and he doesn't have to. He often doesn't give reasons behind what's going on. The events that unfold in our world, let's be honest, they often don't make sense. I was reminded of that yesterday morning at 9 o'clock at the graveside of 11 babies. I got to be honest, it doesn't make sense to me how so many people in the community that we live in could discard their baby just as if it was garbage. I do not understand that. I do understand what does make some sense to me is that we have enough people in our community who are caring and compassionate enough that they would organize so that those babies do not get treated like garbage, but they get treated with love and dignity. I understand one side. I don't understand the other. Because of the kind of trauma and tragedy we experience in the world, Habakkuk wants to lay out for us what the basic tenet of Christianity is. It's not complicated. It's not, a, it's, it's not a long doctrinal discussion. The basic essence of Christianity, not denominationalism, the basic tenets of being a follower of Jesus Christ is this. The righteous live by faith. In good days, in average days, in the worst days you can imagine, the righteous live by faith. It is the faith that makes them righteous. We've all have lived through tough times. You may be in the midst of tough times yourself. Um, Robin needs our prayer. She's going through some tough times because of medication she's on. I lost you. Where are you? There you are. Robin's husband sitting in the back. He's looking good back there. He's just been through rough times himself, physically. The um, Wells family will be sharing at their son's service. Horrible times. Horrible times. What do we do during those times? That's what Habakkuk is all about. On March the 9th, 2002, three women were killed in Chicago, Illinois, when part of a 25-foot aluminum scaffold fell in the high winds from the third, 43rd floor of the John Hancock Center. These three women were each driving their own cars, unsuspecting of any danger falling from above when the incident occurred. The Chicago, Chicago Tribune headline stated this, Tragedy at the Hancock. This tragedy happened just six months to the day after the terrorists flew planes into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., killing 3,063 innocent people. This horrific assault has been labeled the day that changed America. Tragic moments in our life often have labels for us. For those of us who've experienced failure in marriage, we've got words that describe what our failure, what our abandonment felt like. And in the midst of those moments, we wondered if we would ever recover. Tragedy in any form, whether it's tragedy brought on by our own foolish decisions or tragedy that's brought on by, by poor decisions of others. Sometimes they're so very hard to understand and they're even harder to explain and they often are very hard on our faith. Some people in the midst of tragedy lay the blame at the feet of God and they become bitter and cynical towards Him. They often ask for explanations and the response is silent. They ask for understanding and they still remain baffled at how this could happen 
to me. Life is oftentimes a mystery. Much of what happens in life is beyond our ability and our understanding. And even if it were explained to us, we probably wouldn't be satisfied with the answer we got. What we long for in our life is sensibility and reason, and yet what we end up with is insensitivity and unreasonableness. We need to understand one fundamental truth that is spoken throughout the Scriptures from beginning to end, and that is this, that God doesn't always explain Himself. He rarely gives reasons. The events that unfold in our world seldom make sense to us. We therefore are confronted with this foundational bit of, of, of doctrinal truth in Christianity. The righteous shall live by faith. What we're going to look at today is just a very quick overview of the whole book of Habakkuk. And then we're going to come back week by week and we're going to look verse by verse, chapter by chapter at this. Just so you know... Um, how much I like the book of Habakkuk, you can tell how much I bled on the pages of the book of Habakkuk because so many of these verses jump out with, with thoughts and, 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 and God's direction for our lives in the worst moments of our lives. And so what I want to do right now is just look at this, this key theme which Habakkuk comes up with and develops, and that is the righteous shall live by faith. Let's first of all look at an expression of our faith. Perhaps the greatest expression of undaunted faith that's ever been penned comes out of this Old Testament spokesman called Habakkuk. You see, most prophets spoke for the people. Let me say it this way. Most prophets spoke to the people for God. Habakkuk spoke to God for the people. He lived in times that were very hard on their faith. Righteous saw his people suffering and he saw the wicked prospering. Does that ever annoy you? Have you ever noticed in your life that good people seem to have bad things happening to them and bad people seem to have great things happening to them? Rather annoying, isn't it? Habakkuk asked God the two questions that we ask most often. Why me? And how long? Why are these things happening to me? And how long will it be before they are fixed? You see, God revealed to Habakkuk that the Babylonians, the enemy of, 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 of the Israelite nation, God revealed to Habakkuk that the Babylonians, the epitome of everything that Habakkuk detested, and the fact of the matter is God detested the Babylonians. But the Babylonians were going to become God's instrument of judgment on Judah for their rebellion, their consistent, ongoing decades and centuries of rebellion against him. Habakkuk did not understand how God could use this means. He could not explain it to himself or to the nation of Israel, Judah. For a time, God said, evil is going to win over righteousness and you will see a season of bad things happening to good people. God's hand would not be moved from this. His face could not be seen during this period of time. Yet throughout this time of discipline, God reminded Habakkuk of correct living. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, the last part of that verse, the righteous will live by their faith. Habakkuk realized that though he did not understand God's ways or God's timing, he could not doubt God's wisdom and God's love and God's reliability. Then Habakkuk wrote this incredible affirmation of faith in the last chapter of Habakkuk, verses 17 through 19, and later on we'll unpack it a little bit more. But just for today, let me highlight this. Here's what Habakkuk wrote. Though the fig tree does not bud... And though there is no fruit on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no fruit, though there's no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, could life get worse for Habakkuk? I don't think so. Yet, he says, I will triumph in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Habakkuk affirmed that even if everything he relied on failed, if everything that gave stability in his life crumbled, still he would trust in the Lord. If Habakkuk were speaking today, this verse might sound something like this. Though the scaffolds fall, and though the stock market crashes, 
And though planes destroy lives in our nation, though the company I work for goes bankrupt and the economy heads south, and if my house gets foreclosed upon, and if my spouse abandons me, if everything I rely on falters, still I will trust in the Lord. My confidence in God will not waver. That is the expression of faith. I wished I could tell you that has always been my expression of faith. But that is the purpose of faith in our life, is to build us to where we get to this kind of situation that no matter what the problems are around us, our confidence in God does not waver. And then the strength of God in our life will not falter. The second thing I want to point out to you about faith is the importance of faith. How many of you, I, boy, I was in for a big awakening, 8 o'clock service. Uh, and let me just put it to you this way. The 8 o'clock service average age is probably a decade more than this service. Okay? I'm just, not that there aren't a few young people in there, but it's predominantly older than me. My dad also brings up the average age in any service he's in. <laughs> um, but, but I was shocked at how many people. How many of you know who I'm talking about when I mention the name Corey Tenboom? Okay, thank you. How many of you have no idea? It's okay to raise your hand if, if I say Corey Tin, but you have no idea who I'm talking about. Okay, uh, Janet will remember. I probably shouldn't tell this. <laughs> One of the most humorous, Corey Tin Boom wrote a famous book, and I'll tell you about that in just a moment. Her name is Corey Tin Boom. We had somebody who got the name wrong, called in, wanted to know if we had the book written by Corey I'll just let you figure out what they probably said. It was very difficult to keep a straight face and answer the question. Corey Timboom, uh, she spoke on the platform with Billy Graham through the late 70s and to the late 80s at most of his crusades. Um, she spent time in concentration camps during World War II as a child. Most of her family was killed in concentration camps. Her sister was. She was one who got out. She was one who was set free. A most remarkable, humble, well-spoken woman. Corey Ten Boom knew something about tragedy and suffering. And yet even as a child, she lived with courageous faith. Upon emerging from the Nazi concentration camp, this is what she said. She wrote this in her book. Oh, the book you should buy, The Hiding Place. It's not a very thick book, not a very big book, but it's a powerful book. It's still out on the market. You can download it. Go, go to Majesty. They'll order it for you. They probably don't have it in because Harry probably doesn't even know the book. Um, uh, but The Hiding Place, great book to read. This is a quote out of the book. She said, there is no pit so deep that God isn't deeper still. She picked a very apt analogy because pain and tragedy is like a pit that sucks the life out of us. For some, it appears to be a bottomless pit. Many experience a, a failing and a falling, a disorientation, a terror as they grab out, trying to grab the walls to support them and they can't reach them. They see only blackness and they hear only echoes of the life they once knew. And for many, they claim that God is not present or this would not have happened to them. But Corey Ten Boom, like Habakkuk, reminds us that even in the pits of tragedy, God is still there. He is present. There is no doubt, folks, that pain is real. But we should not allow real pain to cause us to think that there is not a real God. That is where our faith comes in. Faith reminds us we may not fully grasp God's design for our lives now, but in time, if we desire, we will come to trust in God's love. And until then... We must believe in him. What does faith believe? Let me give you a couple of, oh, probably five things that faith believes. Number one, faith believes that God is too wise to make a mistake. The God of the universe has a plan for our lives, and he's very busy enacting that plan. It's not always easy for us to discern. Quite frankly, we're often not looking to discern his plan more often than not, we are devising our own plan and asking God to bless it. And then when he doesn't bless the plan we came up with, we're mad at him for not being good to us. 
God says, I've got a plan for you. I'd, be, I'd, love, to, I'd love to orchestrate it in your life. Well, no, God, would you just bless my plan? We often view life as though we are watching a parade through a rolled up program. We have a very narrow focus. We only see what's immediately in front of us. God has, God has this high above perspective of our lives. He sees all of our life at one glance. He sees the beginning and the end of things while we see only the present. We talked a lot about this a few years ago and seeing from lower story or upper story perspectives. We are always wiser after the events than we are in the middle of the events of our lives. While the crisis is occurring, we often are unaware of why we are going through a tragedy it's only afterwards we reflect that, it's, that it finally dawns on us that God was with us all along. You remember what David wrote? Psalm 23, verse 4. Yea, or even though when I walk through the valleys of the shadow of trouble, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. We often don't figure that out till we get on the outskirts of the valley. But God says, don't forget it in the midst of the tragedy. I am with you. Others may forsake you. I will not. Sometimes the tragedy is of your own making. Sometimes it's the making of others. But God said, I won't abandon you in the midst of it all. On a wall of a concentration camp, a prisoner carved these words. I believe in the sun, even when it does not shine. I believe in love, even when it is not shown. I believe in God, even when he does not speak. The second thing is faith believes that God is too kind to be cruel. Over the marble fireplace in the mathematic buildings of Princeton University, written in original German, is this scientific credo, God is subtle, but he is not malicious. God is never malicious in his dealing with us. Whatever he does, he does it for our good. Paul would say from the New Testament to Habakkuk in the Old Testament, Paul would say, Romans 8, 28 and 29, Paul would say, hey Habakkuk, don't forget this. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who were called to his purpose, to those who want his purpose, for those that he foreknew, he predestined to be brought into the image of his son so that we would be the firstborn among all his family. These verses are as important for what they do not say as for what they do say. They do not say that everything that happens is good. It says all things, all things. They do not say that God causes evil. They do not say that everything will turn out okay for everyone. What they do say is God is at work in our world, especially in the lives of his children. His purpose is to make us into the image of his son. His purpose is not to make us rich, though there's nothing wrong with being rich, but that is not as God's purpose. It is not to make us popular, though there's nothing wrong with being popular, but that is not his purpose. His purpose is not even to make us happy. Though in his purpose we will find joy and contentment, his purpose is to conform us, shape us into the image of the one who died for us. Why? Because that was the greatest expression of love. Those who knew no sin, those who knew sin and couldn't become sinless, Jesus Christ died for us. The one who knew no sin became sin so that you and I, by faith, could become the righteousness of God. The third thing faith believes is that God always knows best and he'll do best in his time. When we try to impose our timetable on God, we get into trouble. For example, a man found a cocoon on a tree in his backyard. He was intrigued by it and decided to watch it carefully every day for the changes. One day when he went out, he saw that he could actually see the butterfly through the thin skin of the cocoon. It was working hard. It was struggling to get out. He stood there minute after minute after minute watching it. And finally, he was exhausted watching the butterfly try to get out that he thought he would help it. And he goes into the house and he gets a thin razor blade and he comes back out. And he, he's he just a thin slice in the outer layer of the cocoon. And in just a matter of a second or two, the butterfly escaped the cocoon. Only to discover that because the butterfly got out so easily, 
He did not have the strength in his wings to fly. And in just a moment, the butterfly died. You see, the struggle was necessary for life. Sometimes it is in the struggle that we find the real source of life in us. It is in the struggle that our faith is developed. It is in the struggle that we realize we can't do this. We need someone bigger than ourselves to come live within us and reflect his life through us. Fourth, faith believes that God is in control and therefore we can rest. George Buttrick said, the same sun that hardens clay melts melts wax. It's our choice of whether we're going to let inevitable suffering and the misfortune of life harden us or soften us. We could choose to be hope-filled or hopeless. We could choose to be an optimist or a pessimist. It depends on, by faith, how we look at God. And last of all, faith believes that when we cannot trace the hand of God, we must trust the heart of God. Habakkuk presented a great affirmation of faith in chapter 3, verse 19, when he says, Yahweh, my Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer, enables me to walk on mountain heights. In that part of the world, they had a little tiny deer, and, and it could walk in the most difficult of places. For us in America, we probably think of the mountain goat. When I've been in Montana and I've taken the glasses out and I've seen a a mama mountain goat with a really young baby mountain goat on sheer cliffs, and I look and I say, there's no way that baby mountain goat is going to get off that cliff. And I come back and look 15 minutes later, and they've moved 100 yards on the face of that. I say, how can they do that? And Habakkuk says, when I have faith in God in my troubled moments of life, There's not a cliff so sheer, but what? By his grace and his strength, I can't walk through the trouble. You see, this is the Lord's promise to us. He'll keep us on our feet as we travel the treacherous paths of the troubles of our life. He may not get us out of the trouble, but he promises to get us through. God is here for you and me just like he was for Habakkuk. He will not leave us. He cares too much for us. Even when the night is dark and the storm is raging, know that God is here. Even when you cannot see the hand of God, know the heart of God and trust it. Will you trust him? Will you trust him more than you have in the past? Even if you're wondering how long as Habakkuk did, why God, trust him. Trust him sometimes without explanation, without logic, without reasoning. Trust him. Why? One, because he's God. Two, because he has proven to be trustworthy again and again and again. Let me close with this. It, it brings Habakkuk and Paul together. Um, Paul's passage of uh, all things working together for good. You've been around here long. You've heard it, but maybe you've forgotten it. So let me throw it at you again. There were two boys who grew up together from the time they were just toddlers. They grew up in the same village of Africa. They knew they were going to have very different destinies. One was going to grow up to be the king of his tribe, and the other one was going to be the servant to the king. Uh, The one who was going to be the servant to the king had a quirk in his personality. From the time he was a small boy to a grown man, anytime anything bad happened to him or around him, he did the same thing. He shrugged his shoulders and said, this is good. This is good. Do you know any friends like that? A little annoying sometimes, aren't they? But we love them. We love them. And, and, that, and that was this guy. Well, they grew up. One became keen. One continued to serve the keen. They went hunting one day. The servant prepared the weapon, and he must have done something wrong, for when the keen aimed it at the prey and he fired it, it blew off his thumb. The servant looked at the keen's missing thumb, and he said, this is good. This is good. The keen looked at his missing thumb and said, this is not good. This is not good. And he promptly threw his friend in jail. About a year passed, and the keen went hunting again in an area of the country he should have avoided. Cannibals lived there. They captured the keen. They tied him to the stake. They were just about ready to light the barbecue when they noticed the missing thumb. They were very superstitious. They had never eaten anyone not completely whole, so they cut him loose and set him free. As the keen walked out of the village, he looked at his hand, and he said, This is good. This is good. And then he went straight to prison, and he set his friend free. And he apologized to his friend, and he said, I should have never sent you to prison. And the friend shrugged his shoulders and said, no, this is good. 
This is good. And the king said, how can it be good that a friend send a friend to prison for a year? And the servant looked at the king's missing thumb and he said, if I had not been here, I would have been with you. This is good. This is good. And, and I know it's a goofy story, all right? But the reality is, all the way along the lines, you saw what something tragic God did not waste, and he used it for something good. And he will do the same in your life and mine. But when we are in the midst of the tragedy, and it doesn't make sense, that is when the righteous, who are righteous by faith, will continue to live by faith. That is God's promise to us. I hope you'll come back and we're going to look verse by verse through the book of Habakkuk. What, what are you going to do this week? Read. Read 56 verses. Won't take you long. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for what you can teach us out of a book that was written thousands of years ago. Parts of the book of Habakkuk seem like they were written last week. Give us a mind to understand and a will that will submit to your leadership in our lives in the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. VBS.